Thank you, Grant. Grant's under construction, and uh, so is our church, isn't it, during these days? And so is your life. You're under construction, too. Be careful how you build. The children were singing about that. Make sure you're on the right foundation. Well, Construction Zone, that's our series, and today we're talking about how our church can survive, but more than that, survive and thrive. And our text is the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. Turn there if you have your own Bible or you have an iPad, look it up, or look up at the screen. Ephesians chapter 4. This past Wednesday night, we examined the first two verses. I'm going to read them, but we've already looked at them, but I'll go ahead and tell you that this Wednesday night, we're going to be studying verses 17 through 24. So if you really want to get all of Ephesians in this study, you need to come on Wednesday nights too, and you can join with us. Now chapter 4, starting at verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, and Paul was in prison for his faith, and when he writes this, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. The King James Version says, walk worthy of that calling. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and he gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown this way and that way by every wind of teaching and by cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is God's word for God's people today. Thanks be to God. A guy from the north, I guess New York City, uh, was headed down south on vacation, and uh, somewhere in the deep south, he stopped for breakfast, and uh, he ordered breakfast, just the traditional breakfast, and they, they brought in the plate, and it had eggs and bacon and biscuits, and then a white puddle of something on the plate with some butter floating in it. He called the waitress over, and he said, what is this? And she said, that's grits, honey. And then he said, what's a grit? And she said, honey, they don't come by themselves. <laughs> well, Christians, don't, we don't come by ourselves either. He intended for us to be together, and that's what the church is all about. We come on Sundays to worship, to sing, to pray, to study, to encourage one another, and to show this world that we are the people of God, the church. Leif Anderson, who is a pastor and scholar, has made the observation that in the future, if not already, in the future, churches will have a life expectancy of only about 50 years. Does that startle you? A life expectancy of only about 50 years, with most of the growth happening 
in the first 12 to 15 years. And then after that, it plateaus, levels off, begins to decline, and then it's gone. And I don't argue with him, but it really is of concern to me because our church is 214 years old. We're long past our life expectancy. I got a book yesterday. I can't, I can't wait to get home this afternoon to read some more in it by Francis Fitzpatrick, The Evangelicals. It's a history of evangelicals in America. And it starts back mostly with uh, the first great awakening, then the second great awakening, and on through there. Well, all of that was happening in the 1700s and 1800s. And so it occurred to me last night, most of what this book is going to be talking about, our church has lived through. We've been a church alive and vibrant all these years, but there is no guarantee we will remain so, or that in 50 years we'll still be here. In 25 years, we'll still be here. So we want to survive, don't we? But not just survive, we want to thrive. And that's what our text is going to explain to us. That the goal is to, is to be a church where baby Christians grow up. All believers are stabilized. Truth is spoken in love. And the whole church grows to maturity. So how do we get there? How do we get there? First of all, unity. Unity is a gift that needs to be preserved. Look at verse 3 again. Unity is a gift that needs to be preserved. Make every effort to keep. We don't manufacture it. That comes from God. But we are to keep it. We're to guard it. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Unity is a gift from God to be preserved. My friend David Hull has observed that it is unity of the spirit, not a spirit of unity that he's talking about here. Spirit of unity. That's what your soccer team has. That's what your club has. Churches need it too, a spirit of unity about ourselves. But that's not what he's talking about here. Not a, a, unity, uh, a spirit of unity among ourselves, but a unity of the spirit with a capital S. You see, when we make uh, a unity our goal, a spirit, a feeling of unity our goal, then we're bound to be discouraged because something will happen and, and we'll see that the goal is unattainable and we'll give up. Or we will try to force uniformity on everybody. If, if we're going to be united, then we've all got to agree on everything together. And if you don't agree, then uh, hit the road. It's what I say. I call the shots. Usually a leader will say something like that. If you don't like it, you can leave. And so we're trying to squeeze everybody into one mold. Or if we make unity the goal, then uh, we might lose our courage and compromise when we shouldn't compromise. No, we're talking about unity of the Spirit capital S, unity of the Holy Spirit. The goal there is to focus on Him, and it comes about with a balanced life. Look again at verse 1. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy, and the word worthy there, axios in the Greek language, speaks of a pair of scales, and on one side, you've got your calling, our upward calling, our heavenly calling to be Christians, and on the other side, you've got our conduct, and they need to be in balance so that we're living what we profess, and we do it with humility, he goes on to say. We do it with patience forbearance, and love. The Holy Spirit gives us this unity and wants us to be united. For that to happen, for us to maintain that, we've got to know the difference between non-essentials and non-negotiables. Non-essentials and non-negotiables. Do you know the difference? 
You see, we come from all parts of this nation and really from around the world, and we all bring with us our own unique perspectives on how church is to operate and, and how this verse is to be interpreted as opposed to that verse. Some of these things are non-essentials, but then they're non-negotiables. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one call of God. We need to preserve this unity. You remember the three tenors that sang in the 1990s and early 2000s, those great celebrated tenors, Placido Domingo, Luciano Pavarotti, and the other guy, (laughs) Jose Carreras. Well, they sang, and it was beautiful. When they were in Los Angeles, a reporter asked them, is there ever a spirit of competitiveness between you? Do do you try to outdo each other and be the star? They said, no, you have to put all of your concentration into opening your heart to the music. And there ought not to ever be a spirit of competitiveness here where one is up and another is down. We're all concentrating on the music Our hearts are open to what God is doing. Unity needs to be preserved. But then there's diversity. Diversity. Now, that's a bad word to some people. I'm here to tell you diversity for us is a plus and not a problem. A plus and not a problem. Look at verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That's why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and he gave gifts to men. Do you know what he's talking about here? He's talking about right after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus was on earth for a while, but then he ascended to the Father. And when he got to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit down. That was on the day of Pentecost. And when the Holy Spirit came, he brought gifts. Gifts for ministry, gifts for service, gifted individuals to the church. And everyone is different. He he names some here, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, all of that. There are many, many gifts. Gifts are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, 1 Peter 4. And that even may be a partial list. We don't know exactly how many they are. Paul uh, sometimes likens it to body parts. One body, but uh, the hand can't say because uh, he's not a foot, he's not important. The foot can't say, I'm better than you. The ear can't say, I wish I was an eye. We all have different parts, and together we function. Anybody here this morning from uh, Illinois, from the state of Illinois? There is a little town in Illinois, and you probably know this already, named Oblong. Have you ever heard of it? Small town. Oblong, Illinois. And it's 150 miles from another town in Illinois, Normal, Normal, Illinois. Several years ago, this headline appeared in the social page of the newspaper. Oblong man to marry normal woman. (laughs) And recently it happened again, and it's bound to happen with towns being relatively close together. Now, what's normal anyway? I mean, you are, but uh, how do you define it for other people? Normal. We've all got our differences, our idiosyncrasies, our habits, and they, they create uh, sometimes some, some rubs. They, they create challenges for us, but they make life interesting. And in the church, it's the same. Yeah, they're differences. That's part of God's beautiful creation that he's brought us together. You're sitting beside somebody who votes differently than you do, makes more money or less, is better educated or not as well educated as you, is of one race and you're of another. What is it that unites us together? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. The rest finds us all very diverse. And thank God for that. Diversity is a plus, not a problem. With this diversity, then, comes responsibility. This is number three. Responsibility is parceled out to every member. Look at verse 12. 
All these uh, gifted individuals are given. Apostles, that's kind of like missionaries. Prophets, that's fearless preachers. Evangelists, those are the ones who confront you with the gospel. And then pastors and teachers, and that's what I do. That's what I'm doing right now. Verse 12, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That, that group of individuals there, you might think of them as the professionals. You might think of them as your church staff. And you might even think, because you were raised this way, to believe that we're the ones who do the ministry. It's our job. We get paid to do it. We're acknowledged as those who serve God. And everybody else then is a spectator. And if you like what you see, you keep coming back. You support it. You write a check. You underwrite it. But the professionals do the job. Verse 12 tells us the exact opposite. Our job is to prepare God's people, that's you, for works of service. I failed in my job if I haven't taught you how to do your job. I failed if I've not motivated you to do your part in the ministry, and it takes all of us. In two weeks, Easter Sunday will be celebrated. This is an opportunity you're going to have to do this very thing. We've got several things we need people to pick up and, and work with on Easter Sunday. We've got uh, most Sundays figured out around here now after a month or so in the FAC, but, but Easter's a whole different thing. And we're excited about it, but we know we're going to need every single person to be involved somehow. Right after this service... At about 12.15, we're going to gather again for 12 minutes. That's it. And I'm going to explain what we need and how you can be a part of it, and you can sign up today. But it's true all the time. There's no way any one pastor or any staff, no, no matter how large it is, can do all the work. It's something all of us are called to do. To prepare, that, that also could be translated to equip. And it reminds me of Matthew chapter 4, verse 21, when Jesus is calling James and John. They're on the boat with their father, Zebedee, and they're getting ready to go out fishing again, and they are preparing their nets. So we need to prepare you for the ministry God's called you to. One more word, and that's maturity. Maturity is continually pursued. Maturity. Look at verse 13. Verse 13. Until we all reach unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, so that we're no longer infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up in him who is the head, that is Christ. My, uh, my mentor, Vander Warner, used to, used to say that maturity is the ability to respond appropriately in any given situation. A, a mature person has the ability to respond appropriately in any given situation. And what we're trying to do at our church is help you mature. I don't know that we'll ever say, uh, I'm a mature Christian, because we're all in process. It's better to say, I am maturing. I'm on the road. I'm getting there. More and more resembling Jesus. And that's what you want to have happen in your life. You start the Christian life as a baby, spiritually. You're born again. But then you grow, and, and we love seeing people born again, but we want you to grow and mature into the very image of Christ. Able to speak, he says here, verse 15, able to speak the truth in love. And that's what we mean by responding appropriately. There's some people who love to speak the truth. They love to put you in your place. 
They love to tell you off and tell you how you're wrong. They take delight in it. That's not what Paul's talking about. And then other people, they're all about love, and they wouldn't hurt your feelings for anything. And, and so they'll let a lot of things go, and they'll, they'll see you in trouble. They'll see you in danger, and they won't say a word about it. No, Paul says you put them together speaking the truth in love. There was that horrible uh, church bus accident just a couple of days ago. And, and, and I always, I, they, they weigh heavily on my heart whenever I see them. A busload of senior adults coming back from a trip. And uh, they were hit head on by a truck, a driver, who by his own admission was texting and had been for some time. We know that because somebody was following him and saw him weaving this way and that way, and he's, uh, he gets a, a video of it, and he, he calls 911, and he's saying, somebody's going to get hurt here. Somebody's got to stop this guy. He's speaking the truth in love. It was just too late. We want, don't want it to be too late. And so we need to speak truth into each other's lives. But if we can't do it in love, then let somebody else do it. Let somebody who can do it with love. The goal is maturity. God wants our church to survive, but to thrive. And that takes unity. It takes diversity, responsibility, and maturity. Would you pray with me, please, everyone? We're going to sing in a moment. I'm going to be right here at the front of this room. If there's anybody here today you're ready to present yourself. You'd love to be a part of a church like this. I want you, when we sing in a moment, to step out and come and let us rejoice with you. If you want to give your heart to Christ and be baptized in weeks to come, as you saw, too, this morning, uh, a teenage girl and an adult man, everyone who follows Christ ought to have that experience, then we can do that for you in the days just ahead. Father, speak now to every heart and life and call us to yourself. Give courage where it's needed for people to respond. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and we'll sit.